Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to take a look at multivalent ionic compounds. These are sometimes referred to as multivalent compounds for short, and you may also hear the term polyvalent ionic compounds, which is just a synonym for multivalent ionic compounds. Now I chose this picture here of the fireworks because many of the colors in fireworks are actually caused by multivalent compounds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have three learning goals for today, to identify multivalent ionic compounds from their names and formulas, to determine the name of a multivalent compound from its formula, and to determine the formula of a multivalent compound from its name. So let's start off with what multivalent ionic compounds actually are. Well, they're made of multivalent ions. So what is a multivalent ion? Well, if we take a look at these um, elements here taken from the periodic table, we can see something special in each one of those squares. It indicates the possible charges that each of those elements can take to form an ion. So unlike the elements that we've looked at so far that only had one possibility for the charge that, will, that it will take, and that was based on the column that it was in the periodic table, here, there's actually several possible charges. So if we look at manganese, it can actually have a 2 plus charge, a 3 plus charge, a 4 plus charge, or a 7 plus charge. And all of those are possibilities. So when we make compounds, we actually need to know which one of those ions we're working with. And so when we name the compounds, we need to include that information. So multivalent means that it forms multiple stable ions. And how does that actually happen? Well, if you remember back to our Bohr-Rutherford diagrams, we had very specific rules about how you filled those electron shells, and that you needed to fill a shell before you could move on to the next shell, and that electrons always come out of the outer shells before you start taking electrons from the inner shells. Well, in reality, this isn't quite the truth. And if you take chemistry next year and the year after, you'll learn a lot more about this. But basically, the short answer is what happens is electrons can be pulled from different shells. And depending on which shell they're pulled from and how many electrons are pulled, you can end up with different valences, so different number of um, positive charges on these different uh, metals. So here are the rules for naming multivalent compounds. I'm not going to read through the rules, but if you'd like to pause the video and write them down, you're welcome to. I'm just going to go through the diagram. So you're going to start off by writing the name of the metal. And then in brackets, you're going to write the charge on the metal. So like we said before, manganese could be 2, 3, 4, or 7. So you would write which one of those ions is being used in brackets, and you use Roman numerals. So those are the Roman numerals at the bottom all the way up to 8. You don't need to know further than 8 for this process. So in Roman numerals in brackets, you'll write the charge on the metal. Then you'll write the stem of the, of the non-metal. And then you'll add the ending IDE. So just like we've seen with a lot of compounds, we always add the suffix IDE to indicate that we're dealing with a compound. So let's take a look at an example here. We have Fe2O3. Now, we need to know whether we're dealing with iron 2 or iron 3. We need to figure this out in order to name it because we need to put in brackets which charge we're dealing with. To do that, we'll use a similar method to the zero sum rule. So here, we know that there are two irons, so I'm going to write two. Right now, we don't know the charge on the iron, so I'm going to use x to indicate I don't know the charge. And then I'm going to add that to the three oxygen, so I'll write three. And in brackets, I know that oxygen has a negative two charge based on its location in the periodic table, so I'll write negative two. Now, based on the zero-sum rule, it tells us that all ionic compounds, including multivalent ionic compounds, must have an overall charge of zero. So I know that all of those charges multiplied by the number of each of the ions that we have must equal zero. So let's do some multiplication. 2 times x gives us 2x. 3 times negative 2 gives us negative 6. And that's equal to zero. I can now transfer the 6 to the other side, so I get 2x equals 6, and then divide each side by 2, and I get x equals 3. 
So I know that the charge I'm dealing with for the iron is iron 3. And then I can finish naming. So I know it's iron 3, and I'll write the 3 in brackets. And then I'm dealing with oxygen. The stem of the word oxygen is ox. And then I end, add the ending IDE. So I would end up, whoops, it's kind of hidden there. So I'll write it down here. Iron, one, two, three, oxide. So that would be the name of this compound, iron three oxide. Let's take a look at another example. Here I have FeO. So again, I'm gonna use the zero sum rule to figure out the charge on the iron. So there's one iron of unknown charge X, and there's one oxygen, and it has a negative two charge. And overall, that must equal zero. So that means X, and then one times negative two is negative two. This must equal zero. If I transfer the two to the other side, I get X equals two. So that means I'm dealing with iron two this time. Again, oxygen has the stem ox, and I add the IDE. So this would be called iron two oxide. That's how we would name something like this. Let's look at one last example. Now this shows us why we can't use a crossing over type rule in order to answer these questions. And a zero sum rule is really the only way of answering these questions. So if we used a crossing over, it would look like it would be titanium 2 sulfide. But actually that's not the case. So here we can see that we have one titanium of unknown charge X plus two sulfurs that have a negative two charge, and that has to equal zero. So we have x, and then two times negative two is negative four, that equals zero. And if I bring the x to the other side, or sorry, bring the four to the other side, I have x equals four. So overall charge on titanium is four, not two. So I would name this titanium four sulfide. So this is how we would name a compound like that using the zero sum rule. Now let's look at how to write the formulas when you have the names. So again, you can write these rules down in your notebook, but I'm not going to read through them. I'm just going to go through the diagram. So you're going to start off by writing the symbol of the metal, and then you're going to write the number required as a subscript, and you can either use the zero sum or the crossing over rule to figure out that subscript. Then you'll write the symbol for the non-metal, and then again write the subscript using either crossing over or zero sum rule. So let's start here with copper 2 bromide. Copper 2 is the metal, and copper has a symbol Cu, and we know the charge is 2 plus because it tells us in the name it's copper 2, so that means it's 2 plus. Bromine is the non-metal, which is Br, and it has a 1 negative charge. So now we have two possibilities. You only need to use one or the other, so use whichever you're more comfortable with, but I'm gonna show both ways. So for the zero sum rule, we have a copper with a two plus charge, and we're gonna add that to bromine, which has negative one. Overall, that gives us a one plus charge. That doesn't equal zero, so we need to do some manipulations here. If we have our two plus copper, and we add two of the negative one bromines, that will give us zero because we have two times negative one is negative two and we add that to the two, so that will give us overall zero. So that means we need one of the copper ion and two of the bromide ion. So that means we'll have CuBr2 as our, as our formula. If we use crossing over, here we have Cu2 plus and Br, so if we write the symbols next to each other and take the charge on the copper and write it down here for the bromine and take the charge on the bromine and write it for the copper, now because it's a one negative charge and we don't write subscript ones, we'll just leave it as it is. So we end up with CuBr2. Let's take a look at another example here. Here the metal is cobalt and the symbol is CO. It has a two plus charge because it tells us in the name it's cobalt two. Then we have phosphide. The stem of that is phos, which means it comes from phosphorus, which has the symbol P. And it has a three negative char charge based on its position in the periodic table. 
So we have our two methods here. If we use the zero sum method, we have a two, oops, a plus two charge, and we add that to a negative three charge that gives us negative one overall. To make this equal zero, we need three of the two plus charges, and we need two of the negative three charges to give us zero. So that means we need three of the cobalt ions, and we need two of the phosphorus ions. So that means we end up with CO3P2. Now if we try the crossing over method, we'll write the two symbols next to each other, and we'll use the charge on the cobalt as the subscript for the phosphorus, and the charge on the phosphorus as the subscript for the cobalt, so we end up with CO3P2. So we have three learning goals again, to identify multivalent compounds from their names and formulas, to determine the name of a multivalent compound from its formula, and to determine the formula of a multivalent compound from its name. If you can do these things, fantastic. If not, please re-watch the video, and if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. Alright, that's all for now. Bye-bye.